slide. Here we go. So I know this is supposed to be about trees, but I'm going to open with a bird fact. And this is really quite remarkable. Um, hatchlings need protein to grow and they need a lot of it. Um, there were some studies done where chickadees were observed bringing caterpillars to their nest and they come very frequently every three minutes or so bringing a caterpillar back to the nest. And this is adding up to 350 to 570 caterpillars per day over a period of 16 to 18 days. That adds up to 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to fledge a nest of chickadees. And chickadees are not large birds. Um, so you can imagine that's, that's a lot of food that, that birds need in order to, to fledge. Um, so that brings me to what, what is reoaking. So reoaking is a concept about supporting nature in our cities and native trees are extremely important in order to be able to do that. I'll talk a little bit more about how that happens, but um, there have been quite a few studies done on this topic, uh, looking at native landscapes, yards with non-native plants in this particular study were 60% likely to have a breeding chickadee nest. Um, they had fewer eggs and were less likely to survive. And in Northern California, we find that uh, birds are using the native valley oak three times more frequently than other trees for foraging. It's probably because there's more food in that valley oak. And riparian habitat has been identified as being extremely important, riparian habitat being creekside habitat, of course. And if you look at our creeks um, coming through our urban areas, this is where you're gonna find the most um, intact native trees. Why do we care? Birds are vanishing from, from North America. Uh, there's, we have quite a few alarming headlines over the past couple of years. The number of birds in the United States and Canada has been declining significantly. There are about 400 species of North American birds that are at risk of extinction. I've shown this headline and people thought, oh no, there's too many insects, you know, the insects are coming to get us. This is actually the opposite of that. Um, this study, there was a study done, this, um, there's an article in the New York Times, which perhaps you've seen, uh, talking about how just the sheer biomass of insects has declined significantly across the world. Uh, one particular study done in Germany, uh, they basically took nets out and caught uh, insects and weighed them over a period and were able to go back 27 years later and found a 75% decline in the biomass of insects. So that's, that's quite a loss. Here in California, of course, um, we are probably, many of you are familiar with the plight of the monarch butterflies. Now there's many reasons for, uh, they're probably contributing to loss of monarchs. We have um, global climate change, uh, the use of pesticides, but um, there's also a very important factor, which is that their larval host plant, the milkweed is also in decline. And the reason, you know, the insects need native plants is because they only know, many insects are specialized. They only know how to eat certain types of plants. Um, and many, many years of evolution have gone into insects learning how to eat a specific species of plant. And all the plants have slightly different chemistries and different adaptations in order to protect themselves because they don't want to be eaten. Um, and so various insects have over time learned how to overcome that and learning to overcome the defensive of one species of plant does not mean that you can go and move to another plant and eat that plant equally well. Um, so I like to tell people when I'm out with volunteers, you think your children are picky eaters, insects are extremely picky eaters. And this also requires kind of a change in your mindset about your garden. Um, I would love for people to start looking at their plants in their garden and thinking, oh good, there's some holes in this leaf. That means some insects are getting fed um, in the ecosystem. Insects are getting fed, birds are getting fed. The monarch is not the only plant, uh, not the only butterfly that requires uh, one specific species to lay their eggs on. Um, locally, we have uh, Lorcan's admiral butterflies, which need willows in their caterpillar stage. The echo azure butterflies need the California buckeye or dogwood in their caterpillar stage. And those caterpillars are really what um, is a valuable food source for birds, particularly in the nesting phase. 
if you look at, um, this is borrowed from the SFEI report called Sil um, sorry, Rio King Silicon Valley. Um, the, sorry, my kid just waved at me. <laughs> the, the home Zoom was challenging. So the, in Silicon Valley, historically, we see a, a tree species distribution of under 20 species total. And the green is representing the oak trees. So the dark green is valley oak, Quercus lobata. Um, the slightly less dark green is coast live. And then there's black oak. And then they're comprising, you know, close to, I guess, about 75% of, um, of the native tree cover, the, tree, the total tree cover in Silicon Valley. Compare that to now. And we have an extremely, uh, we've introduced many, many species of plants to our cities. Approximately 400 species are now um, in our cities and oaks are now comprising about 4%. Um, a lot of this is perhaps due to, you know, we have an interest. There's many, many different kinds of species. A lot of them are very beautiful and bring all kinds of, um, you know, interesting traits or other traits that we find desirable for our cities. Um, also with, uh, after the Dutch elm disease decimated many, many elms on the East Coast, uh, you know, there was, I think, an industry-wide um, call for more biodiversity of trees in the city so that we don't lose whole swaths of our tree cover. However, you know, I, th I think we've swung a little bit too far in that direction, seeing this um, change from 20 tree species to 400. And basically where, where we are now is um, a situation where you have quite a high biodiversity of tree species, but that biodiversity is not supporting the biodiversity of our ecosystem. Now there's a lot of other benefits as well to reoaking, and some of these are not, um, they're not unique to oaks or native trees. Um, besides the food for the ecosystem. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The sense of place that native trees brings, I think is really important. We have so many spaces that are named after, for example, Oaks, Oakland comes to mind, um, Walnut Creek. There's many place names that we're relying on are, that are named after trees that have been here for many years. Um, locally native trees, we think, are the best suited to survive climate change. They have been here for many, many years and have seen a lot of changes over time. Um, and then finally, for climate change, carbon sequestration. A lot of our native trees are some of the larger trees and carbon sequestration really with size is kind of a, um, one of the factors that contributes to that, of course. And you know, so why why do we need to bring native trees back to our cities? Well, the valley floor, particularly in Silicon Valley, is overwhelmingly developed, as you know. Um, and but open space is really not enough. It's it's pretty fragmented. Uh, there's not really connectivity from the foothills down to the bay. Uh, some of our creeks do provide that, but we've lost a lot of that connectivity that previously existed. And open space is also impacted by um, invasive species that are, in many cases, escaping from our yards. Uh, privet is one of those examples of an invasive tree that, that easily colonizes, especially along our creeks. Um, acacia, tree of heaven, catoniaster, and uh, even the Canary Island palm are trees that we've seen quite a few of. There, I could go on with this list, but we'll stop there. This photo is showing a picture of privet and um, cedar waxwings eating the privet fruit. So yes, while these you know, plants are providing food, um, it's not, again, the, the protein that is really required for the, um, for the nesting period and also just for the bird's growth. Um, Claire likes to call it dessert, and for privet in particular, the birds are digesting this fruit and carrying the seeds with them and depositing them in other places where they are starting to proliferate. Claire has a nice blog we have currently up about the privet, so check that out. It's also on the, our resource list. 
go through a few examples of common trees that you might see um, in our neighborhoods and maybe some native alternatives. So this was put together by Sarah Witt. She, she is a big fan of small creatures. Um, the crepe myrtle is one that is very popular. It supports um, only three species according to a study on the East Coast and also hosts the glossy winged sharp shooter, which is an extremely problematic um, pest, particularly for agriculture. Um, we thought, well, if you like pink flowers, perhaps the Western wed red bud could be a nice alternative. The flowers attract many, many uh, species of native bees, of which there are, I believe the number was about 1600. Is that right, Claire? Not at me. Yes, 1600. Um, so there's many, many species of bees. If you plant natives in your yard, you'll be amazed at all the different looking bees that, that you'll be able to see. Here is a picture of Oracle uh, campus where they have planted some Western redbud out front. So it can be used as a street tree. It does wanna be, the Western redbud wants to be more multi-trunked. So it requires some training in order to get it into more of a traditional street tree shape, but it can be done. Um, the Bradford pear is uh, from Asia and supports no butterflies or moths, no caterpillars here in the United States. That's quite pretty, but another alternative perhaps is Ceanothus. Um, Ceanothus comes in many, many shapes and sizes. You can get it as ground cover. You can get it as basically a small tree. It does also require um, pruning and training in order to uh, achieve this tree shape, but it provides a ton of awesome habitat for various pollinators, birds, and all of that. The London plane tree is also quite common. It's a, actually a hybrid of two sycamore species, one from the US and one from Asia, neither from California. Um, the, it's not providing a ton of habitat value here. We do have a native sycamore that is found in certain riparian areas. It's probably not as well suited to being an urban street tree. Um, the big leaf maple is a nice alternative for um, areas that get uh, enough water. It's a riparian tree. So um, we've seen it. This is a, a specimen that's in Foothills Park along in the edge of a lawn area. And this is kind of a space where it might do really well. A beautiful tree. Uh, Southern magnolias with these white flowers and the nice big waxy leaves um, are actually native to the southeast United States. Only two of the 19 butterfly moth species that the plant supports are present here in California. Um, and we use it a lot even though the roots can be somewhat problematic for sidewalks and it needs a lot of water. Um, we thought maybe another alternative is the California Buckeye, which is a beautiful tree that hosts six Lepidoptera, meaning butterfly and moth species, and also butterflies love this tree, these beautiful flowers. It's very drought tolerant. I will provide the caveat, or, you know, share the caveat that um, its drought tolerance strategy is actually to drop its leaves early. So if you're looking for a good shade tree, this is not necessarily the best choice because it will just give decide to take a rest and um, drop its leaves. But it has a beautiful shape and form. And even without its leaves, I think it's quite striking. Um, this is a photo of a buckeye in the median in on University Avenue in Berkeley. And there they have, um, you know, I think dealt with the deciduousness, the early deciduous issue by alternating it with the coast live oaks, which are evergreen. And another specimen that is a few uh, buckeyes, another median in Berkeley. The Chinese pistache turns fair, the leaves turn very red in the fall, you might um, recognize. And it hosts a couple of species in California. Um, but the black walnut is looking at supporting over 25 species and provides um, is as a nice drought tolerant tree.
you don't see this one very often. We had to kind of hunt the internet for this example of a black walnut in a parking lot. Um, finally, the liquid amber. You may have, like me, almost fallen over on the sidewalk to, due to its spiky balls that fall all over the place. Um, it hosts two moth species, whereas the California oaks, again, kind of the marquee species for our area, is really a powerhouse for habitat um, value. There's four uh, species that are relatively common in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Coast Live Oak, Black Oak, Valley Oak, and Blue Oak. And I think Maya's going to talk, talk a little bit more about each of those species in her presentation. But the oaks are, are amazing. They are a host plant for over 800 species of insects. Um, and the species diversity is really important because these insects are um, becoming available as food for the ecosystem at different times of the year. And so, um, you know, and also if one species has a bad year, there are other species available for, um, for filling in that, that purpose in the ecosystem. Of course, the acorns are important food for many, many species. And the structure of the tree is also extremely important. Now there's oaks in a lot of different um, parts of the world. And unfortunately, plucking an oak from the East Coast does not equal um, using an oak that's native to this area. So it is important to, to keep our, our local native species here. Um, now you may think oak trees, they're huge. This picture on the left um, is an example of quite a majestic oak tree in a Palo Alto neighborhood, but it takes hundreds of years to get to this size. And so I like to tell people maybe, you know, don't worry about this giant tree being in your yard because it's going to be about 300 years before we get to that point. So you don't need to worry about that. Um, there are, you know, this picture on the right is actually an oak tree that a squirrel planted in my yard. And I've decided to leave it there. It's, it's probably about 10 years old or so. And even though it's a small little sapling, I see tons of um, insect activity on it. There's galls and um, lots of things buzzing around all the time. When I move out of the house, I keep saying I'm going to chop down this random eastern maple and leave the oak tree there. Um, here's some examples of other oaks. Um, in Menlo Park on the left in a parking lot where there is space, you know, it's an urban area, but you've got there are places where an oak tree can certainly fit. And on the right is at a school campus, there's a valley oak that has been planted there and they've got room for it to grow. If you are willing to be creative and diligent, you can also prune your oak tree into a lollipop. Uh, this is actually in my neighborhood. You can also recreate kind of the African savanna feel by, I don't, I don't recommend either of these treatments or any of these treatments for your oak trees, but um, you know, the tree is still there. It's providing some habitat value. So if you prefer your tree to be lollipop shaped, then go for it. Um, this is a hedge where probably an oak, you know, an acorn snuck in there and grew into the hedge and just kept getting sheared along with the rest of the um, shrubs that are here. So if you look closely, kind of in the middle, you can tell that there's some valley oak leaves in there. Um, so just to conclude the, the reoaking discussion, um, I wanted to share a few different considerations. So hopefully now you're convinced let's put more native trees in our neighborhoods. And you know, how do we do that? What should we, what should we do? Um, and I wanna advocate for, first of all, let's, let's make sure that we're protecting our existing large trees. It takes decades, hundreds of years for these trees to grow to this size. And they're providing, in addition to you know, the insect activity and food providing, um, they also provide other really important values that trees provide, shade, carbon sequestration, um, their structure, they have cavities where certain birds need for nesting, and they also capture quite a bit of stormwater, especially the, the trees that are evergreen will actually catch quite a bit of 
water in their leaves and slowly allow it to um, hit the ground and slow down the water from entering our urban streets and storm systems quickly. So this applies, I would say, not only just to our native trees, but our non-native trees as well. Yes, I would keep the non-native large trees. <laughs> Um, as we plant more trees in our urban areas, um, really including companion plants and understory is also quite beneficial. It, having the layers provides additional stormwater capture, for example. And then there's also a lot of habitat value um, as opposed to having just the tree plunked in the middle of the cement, um, having this grassy area provides additional space for roots. It provides um, cover for various insects and um, other animals. And there's quite a few, there are, for example, moth species that will pupate underground. And so if they don't have access to ground, they wouldn't be able to grow the next generation. Um, again, leaf litter and mulch are, are, are your friend <laughs> in many situations. They can help with water infiltration, protect the soil from drying out, um, help keep weeds down, and they also add nutrients to the soil. Hopefully you can spot the skink in this one, in this shot to the left. Um, on a neighborhood scale, we might strategize our oak planting around some existing large oaks. Uh, there's a value to having not just a single solitary tree in a vacuum, but to have it be part of a network of trees. And so particularly when you're talking about birds and foraging, um, if a bird has to fly really far to get to the next tree to find food, then um, it's wasting a lot of energy. So having these um, communities of trees is very valuable as well for cross-pollination. Finally, the um, when selecting species, say for your yard or whatever your site is, um, consider the difference between are you in the foothills, are you near the baylands, there are different species of trees are suited to different areas. So you live along the baylands, you probably wouldn't plant um, a blue oak, say, but a coast live oak might work better. And in the, um, you know, we recognize that for street trees, there's a lot of considerations. It may not be possible to every time select a locally native tree for that situation. And so in that case, I would advocate for considering the continuum of, um, you know, first let's look at the Bay Area trees and then next maybe trees that are native to California or the West Coast or North, Car North America as opposed to um, going to other continents. This is borrowed from uh, Douglas Ptolemy's presentation. I screenshotted while he was talking because I liked these slides so much. Um, in the past, we've really put a lot of weight on decorative value as a reason to select our plantings. Um, but there's so many more other criteria to consider. And so I hope that um, as we Maybe some of you become landscape architects in the future, or as you're considering what plants you have in your own yard, we consider all of these factors. Here at Grassroots Ecology, we have gonna share just a couple projects with you before I pass this off to Maya. Um, we, we do have some projects that are in urban areas. And this is one that I've been really excited to watch over the last few years in downtown Redwood City we had, uh, we were able to get a grant from the Coastal Conservancy to remove about 60 Canary Island palm trees. Uh, and we replaced them with native trees, shrubs, and various wildflowers. And today the site, well, in the spring, the site looked like this. Today it's a slightly crispier, but we did plant coast live oak trees and valley oaks and a few buckeyes and big leaf maples at this site um, in partnership with City Trees, which is in urban forestry organization in Redwood City. We also planted some elderberries. Um, elderberry is a great habitat plant, but it really wants to grow to be a multi-trunked um, tree and it's kind of a, it's very rangy. It grows really fast. Um, the, from the picture on the left, this was planted about a year and a half later. It's this tall, so it's quite fast grower, but as a result, if you want to shape it into a proper tree, it takes a lot of attention. 
um, this area just happens to be a place where we're okay with a little bit of mess and um, we want we want that habitat value so we're trying to create an elderberry forest here that's my dream uh, we also partnered with uh, canopy at a couple sites in east palo alto this is at the uh, St. Francis, Francis of Assisi site where they have a rugby field and we planted some uh, native valley oaks. Here's a red bud and I believe that's a manzanita in the background. We also along a back fence put in some holly leaf cherries and that's another really um, valuable wildlife plant. It supports about a, over 140 species of um, butterfly and moth in this area. And this actually is about three, three years after planting. We planted, when we planted them, they were probably about a foot tall. And so they've really come in very nicely in three years. Um, at the end of a cul-de-sac um, in East Palo Alto again, this is a very tough, dry site and uh, with only hand watering. Again, in a partnership with Canopy and some white sages are doing really nicely here. And we also have an elderberry in the background. Uh, if you volunteer with us, you'll know that we spend a lot of time removing invasive plants um, such as privet and uh, Tree of Heaven, which is pictured here. This is Tree of Heaven along San Francisco Creek. Um, that tree in particular is very prolific, putting out little saplings everywhere. And then you've probably seen algae and ivy climbing our native trees. Um, many of the oak trees along our creeks get uh, covered in the Algerian ivy and that weight is really not healthy for those trees. You can get ahead of it by just cutting it at the base and it'll die off and slowly fall out of the tree over time. It's one of the most satisfying uh, activities, in my opinion, <laughs> cutting ivy out of trees. In our open spaces, we're trying a few things. Um, because planting an actual, like a container tree requires quite a bit of care and maintenance over time, you have to go water it. Um, we're trying some other things to help our trees along in open spaces. So one of those things is to cage saplings at Arashadero Preserve. Uh, these are saplings that have planted themselves. So they've already picked a good spot and uh, they just need a little protection from browsing from deer. Uh, our, you know, our apex predator population is pretty low now. And so we have more deer than we historically may have had. And so that has um, a detrimental effect on our, our tree populations in open space. Uh, at another of our sites in the Sierra Azul Preserve uh, near Los Gatos, we are planting acorns and buckeyes as uh, the acorn and the buckeye nut so that they are growing from seed and then they don't require all the constant watering. And this is a buckeye growing in a container. And again, it's protected in a cage um, from browsing. So what can you do? <laughs> Come volunteer with us or with Canopy. There's other also um, our city forest in San Jose actually plants a ton of native species and they have a nursery there as well. Um, city trees here in Redwood City and then Save the Bay also does a ton of native planting of course along the bay. There's not so tr not trees so much but a lot of native plants in our urban environment. Um, we hope you're inspired to plant more natives at home. Um, also to remove invasives at home or um, as a volunteer with us. And ask your city or school to plant more native trees. Another thing that would be awesome is getting involved in local government decisions. A lot of cities have master tree lists. I encourage you to look up your city and see if it has one. Um, we went ahead and looked at uh, tree lists in the local area and um, nine cities in the area that have tree lists, we counted up the number of species on their list and the average was 43 tree species. Only 3.3 of them on average were locally native species. So there's a lot of room to, I think, add a few more options that are locally native here. Um, Cities also develop things like urban forestry plans, climate action plans. These are all opportunities to convince uh, your local officials to include a statement um, saying something like, let's you know, have more native species in our urban forest. 
Finally, I'll leave you with uh, Claire's recommendation, which is to be a squirrel and just find an acorn and put it somewhere where it might grow into a tree someday. Um, places under uh, existing shrubs uh, are great for protecting them from browsing. And this is a picture of Claire with her uh, 10 year old sapling that started from an acorn that she planted at our Astrodera Preserve. And that's all I have. Thank you for listening. It's really all right. Oops. Can everybody see that? Hopefully you can. Um, so I'm going to give you um, some background about what Canopy does in the Mid Peninsula in terms of our tree planting programs, but and also why we do what we do. Um, but first off, I'd like to say um, thank you to Grassroots Ecology for having me at this um, awesome presentation. Um, I think we don't talk enough in the environmental science world about urban nature and the value of, of having equitable open space and access to greenery in urban settings. So many of us live in cities, work in cities for pretty much all of our lives. And so I think this is something that's really valuable. Um, my background is in habitat restoration. I, um, through my undergraduate studies, and then as I served as an intern with grassroots ecology a couple of years back, and um, then I was part of the California Naturalist Program. So my heart is really dedicated to California ecosystems and ecology, while also being strongly dedicated to equity and uh, access to nature for, uh, for communities that don't have equitable access. Um, so Canopy is a urban forestry nonprofit, which means we plant trees and work and care for trees in cities. Uh, our mission is to grow the urban tree canopy in mid-peninsula communities for the benefit for, for all. We started in Palo Alto, but um, we have grown into other communities. My program specifically is in East Palo Alto, as well as Eastern Menlo Park in a community called Bell Haven. And then this year I started uh, the program in North Fair Oaks, which is unincorporated Redwood City. And so as an organization, we hope to see a day where every resident of the Mid Peninsula, regardless of the city that they're in, um, has the opportunity to walk and live and, and spend their lives under the shade of healthy trees. So Canopy has three main programs. We have our plantings program, our tree programs, where we do free tree plantings. This is free trees for schools, um, parks, uh, parking lots, um, and neighborhoods. We, we do park strips and we do private property tree plantings. And then we have an education wing that, that goes into schools and teaches youth about um, why trees are so important and their role in climate change. Uh, we have an intern program that we, where we have uh, high school interns from East Palo Alto learn how to do this kind of work and hopefully inspire them to uh, pursue a career in sustainability field, maybe forestry. And then we have an advocacy wing that works with local governments to create uh, equitable, strong, um, clear tree policies that, that do all the things we were just talking about, that protect large trees from being removed easily to promote tree planting, et cetera. And then under these, we have uh, tree care. We do tree care for all of our trees, and then we have outreach programs to make all of our events very community-based. And so these numbers are a little outdated. Last year, before I was on board, Canopy planted their 5,000th tree. Um, since then, I've planted a, a little over 100 more. Um, over you know, it's about 3,000 trees in East Palo Alto since we've, we came there in 2006. We've cared for all of, for most of our trees. Uh, we care for all of our trees for the first three years of life uh, in terms of structurally pruning them to avoid some of those problems we were talking about. And um, we've educated a lot of students about the value of trees. And so I wanna spend most of my time talking about this concept called the green gap. It's also called the gray green gap, which is a little bit of a helpful. So this is a map of the Bay Area. 
you can zoom in in the middle. That's the mid peninsula where Canopy focuses our work. The yellow highlighted areas have up to 89% canopy cover. And the dark blue areas are on the low end with as high as 11% canopy cover. This is a really striking difference and it's really unfair. And so this green gap is exactly this. It's where there are certain communities, sometimes within the same city or in different cities right next to each other that have a drastically different canopy cover and this greatly impacts community health, it greatly impacts their climate ability to be climate resilient, and it impacts biodiversity levels. So if you look at Menlo Park, most of Menlo Park is bright yellow, doing great. But if you go right over the freeway to northeastern Menlo Park in the community called Bellhaven, it's dark blue. And if you went there, it would be very, very obvious how different this particular neighborhood is from the rest of the park. And so there are a few really important reasons to acknowledge why this is happening in urban settings, but it mostly follows development patterns that create unequal living environments for underrepresented populations. Now this image is, I think, even more striking. Um, this really exemplifies the gray green gap. And you see Palo Alto Menlo Park, lush green, tree-lined streets, trees in the neighborhood, um, parks, etc. East Palo Alto is more gray than green. A um, lot of concrete, which means suffering from he urban heat island effect, um, lots of heat, uh, which may reduce physical activity, which may increase um, various um, health issues. There's a lot of things um, that get perpetuated when there's less trees in an urban environment. However, I, wanna, I really wanna um, talk about why this is the case. So I'm gonna focus on East Palo Alto because that's where my programs are and this is the community that I serve. Um, East Palo Alto became a city kind of quote unquote late in the game when compared to Palo Alto and Menlo Park. It was incorporated into cityhood in 1983. And so, in a way, the city is playing catch up compared to the cities around it. Um, in its formation, there were a lot of financial struggles and the city did not have the budget to put towards things such as trees. You know, it wasn't top of mind. Things that were top of mind were putting in sewer lines, putting in water lines, building more houses out. Um, and so trees just weren't in the equation. Um, there's, to this day, there isn't um, a single staff member dedicated to this kind of work. There's no parks departments. There, um, Canopy is working on an urban forestry master plan, but it, it takes a long time. One, because it's financially very difficult to sustain these research, this re kind of research to inform this policy, but also because um, it takes a lot of research. Um, and that there's just not a lot of staff. So there's a concept called redlining that I'd like to talk about because it's really key to the development of East Palo Alto. In the US, redlining is the systematic denial of um, services by the federal government and local governments and even private sectors, you know, private homeowners or, or landowners, I should say, uh, through the selective raising of prices and this combined with blockbusting, which is, is how East Palo Alto came to be. There were landowners who owned much of the land that raised prices, that segregated certain you know, low-income folks of color for the most part into certain areas. There was low-income housing, blockbusting, um, which is where, um, the practice of persuading owners to sell property inexpensively or cheaply because of the fear of people of another race or class moving into the neighborhood and thus profiting from reselling at a higher rate. And so these practices really shook the community of East Palo Alto to, to where it is today. Um, and so when people are are struggling financially to, to make ends meet, to, to pay high rent prices. You know, trees may not be the, the top of mind idea. 
And so th these practices combined with a city that didn't have great resources to even take care of existing trees created uh, the gray green gap. Um, however, this, this isn't fair and this is why Canopy has decided to bring our free trees planting, our free tree planting program to the, the city um, before our advocacy wing to help with this, uh, the, the writing of the urban forestry master plan and advocate for tree protection laws that protect large trees, while also planting free trees for residents and doing a lot of tree care to help kind of supplements all that work that goes into planting trees. Um, it's just a fact that rich communities have a larger budget to spend on public forests and they have larger, this is a key point, they have larger private lots or private trees can be grown. In East Palo Alto, the lot sizes are much smaller than in Menlo Park in Palo Alto. And I know Junko talked a lot about, well, you can still fit an oak. Not, that's not always the case. Yes, it does take hundreds of years for it to get big, but that fear is enough for someone not to want to take a, a large tree. The fear of, of one day I'm going to have to pay for this thing. One day this thing might fall on my house. Um, and so, and also a lot of the lot sizes are really built out. How, um, there are a lot of the, the lot is covered by house or concrete is usually the way most of the properties are. And the third thing that I run into when I'm talking to people about planting tree, even if they have a nice open lawn, chances are there's a water line under that lawn. And so you can't plant a big tree on a water line because the roots will go and grab any kind of moisture and destroy that line become a huge liability on the residents. So all these things come into play when planting trees in an urban setting. However, we still want to repair this great green gap for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the primary reasons is biodiversity levels are greatly impacted when there are less trees in a community. Um, there was a research study that found that um, bird diversity could not be um, determined by the amount of parks or even the size of parks in, an, in a city. It actually really depends on the parks and the surrounding neighborhood, and the surrounding neighborhood really was key. Um, some of you might know that wildlife really doesn't just want to sit in one hot spot and then fly a, a lot far away to another hotspot. Um, habitat fragmentation is when habitat has been broken up through human development. And so if the human development there doesn't have any trees, it's really hard for species to get to one another, um, to meet others in their species with a different genetic variety and, and procreate and continue their line. Um, so even if you have beautiful parks or parks with some trees, if it's just, you know, two, three parks in a city and the neighbors don't have, you know, a, a flourishing canopy, biodiversity levels are going to drop. Uh, community health is also greatly impacted by tree canopy cover. I've talked a little bit about the urban heat island effect. Um, which, let's see, so it can be the, let's see, so basically built up areas uh, can be hotter um, when there's less tree canopy cover and there's more concrete. And the annual mean air temperature of a city with 1 million people or more can be 1.8 to 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than its surroundings. And so not only is this bad for, for people's health and not wanting to be outside, in terms of not wanting to be outside, but also um, this can increase air pollution, perpetuate poor air pollution. Um, trees do a great job at cleaning our air. And so um, another thing that Canopy does is we do a lot of tree plantings along the freeway, since these communities that I've discussed are kind of cut in half by the freeway and there are a lot of houses on the other side. Trees are you know, the first line of defense from stopping toxic air pollutions uh, from car exhausts, from entering residents' lungs and causing lung disease. 
There's lowering stormwater runoff and storing carbon, as Junko talked a lot about. Um, in order for communities to be climate resilient, they need a healthy urban forest. Uh, trees are a great way to fight climate change. I know there's a big push for solar panels, and I, I, I'm for it, solar power. But if you can plant a tree to shade your house and reduce energy usage, and then that tree will biodegrade at some point instead of a solar panel that is difficult to recycle um, or can be wasteful in its uh, decomposition, I think that the tree would be a, a greater alternative. Um, studies have also found that greener neighborhoods have lower crime rates, um, which is incredibly important. Uh, trees reduce crime and uh, reduce anxiety and stress and create um, more calmness of mind, which is really important all the time. I think about this more and more now in the current pandemic situation. You know, there's a lot of fear and anxiety um, going around in the world right now. And I just wish we all had access to go outside and sit under a tree and, and try to take a breath. Um, but unfortunately, not everybody has that. So Canopy, um, we work on creating community engagements through youth, our teen urban foresters and our junior forestry leaders. Uh, those are the middle schoolers and the teens are the high schoolers go out into their communities. They're educated about the green gap and about um, the value of trees. And they um, not only do the work, they plant the trees with us, but they go out and they talk to people, their neighbors about this, these issues, because at the end of the day, you know, there's a lack of knowledge and education um, that just wasn't accessible to many generations that prevents people from really understanding why this is important, that why even though yes, sewage and water and all those things are obviously important, trees are very important. Um, urban nature is very important. And maybe now that this pandemic has happened, you know, the idea of outdoor classrooms has come up, maybe that'll promote more tree planting, more um, native garden planting so that children can experience nature in a new way. Um, but using youth has been a really great um, approach for us. We also have community forestry school, which um, is more of an adult education course that we offer every fall that you all can sign up for. It's kind of, it's modeled after the California Naturalist Program. We talk about um, tree identification, how to plant tree, trees and actually a lot of it's about how to be urban forest advocates and how to go to city meetings and talk about these issues with your representatives. Uh, Claire mentioned earlier this project at um, San Francisco Creek in East Palo Alto that we partnered on. Um, this January we planted over a hundred acorns, um, oak acorns along the creek together. Um, and it was a really great project. It, I was there today. The, the plants are looking great and the acorns are sprouting. And so hopefully, you know, a few years we'll have a really vibrant oak woodland right there. Uh, this is just a picture from January 20th this year. We had a ton of people out and it was really a great partnership with Grassroots. And I'm really glad I was a part of it. And then lastly, I'll talk about a program of ours that I don't work on, but um, I think you all will find interesting. It's called the Great Oak Count. So um, you'll see it on our website as GOC. So um, the Great Oak Count is run by my coworker, Elise. And our organization was founded in Palo Alto um, because there was, there were residents that, that found that oak trees were getting removed so people can build bigger houses and they saw that that was a problem. So there's an increasing recognition that re -oak, integrating oaks into our parks and urban landscape prom promises a host of benefits for wildlife and uh, people. And so as a first step, Canopy has tried to revive a comprehensive study. Oops, my screen went, sorry. Um, to update this oak well survey. Um, 
So the original Palo Alto Native Oak survey happened 20 years ago and went out and measured oaks, you know, took, a, took measuring and readings about the, the vigor, the, gro the growth of the oak, took pictures, and also uh, distributed Native Oak Care tips to homeowners. And so we do this every year, every year in the summer um, with volunteers. And so uh, volunteers go neighborhood to neighborhood collecting oak viability issue and, and ma mapping it in our database and then continuing to engage homeowners uh, to help them care for their oaks. And so we, the goal is to see how the oak population has changed and to learn more as uh, Palo Alto moves into a re-oaking system. Um, and so you can check out our website for more information. But I can hold, we already saw this a little bit, but here is just um, a map of some oaks surveyed. Uh, I guess it's a little outdated, but it's the one we had on file. And so you can see where there's some gaps, some less and less oaks. So, um, so a lot of different players in this project, Canopy staff, we have leader, survey leaders that um, show up for us every year and, and, and they know what they're doing. They know how to identify oaks and they do a lot of the technical work. And then we have general volunteers that we train. Um, and we're try we usually try to get the same volunteers every year and then also add new ones because we want the same people who, who know the skills and know what to do to train younger folks. So the four oaks that we survey are the native ones, um, the four native ones to our Bay Area region, the black oak. And so we go through identification courses before sending volunteers out into the wild because some of these oaks can be a little tricky to identify firsthand. Um, so that's the black oak. We've got the blue oak, um, which looks a little bit more like a coast live oak. I know I get thrown off whenever I see it, so it's important to know the certain characteristics of this oak. And there's the valley oak. It looks a little bit like the black oak uh, on first hand. So checking out the bark on addition to the leaves as well as the acorns is really important. And then there's our famous Coast live oak uh, with its cupped, serrated leaves and dark green, shiny leaves. And so we would love to have you join us. We're starting a little late this summer, but we're hoping to start in July um, with COVID. You know, things shut down for us for a little while, but we are implementing safety protocol and we're going to tweak the great oak count a little bit to keep everybody safe, meaning less interaction with the homeowners. But, and that's a bummer, but it's it's going to work out as long as we collect the data and do a hands-free, you know, contactless delivery of information. I think it can really work. So right there is Elise's contact info. She is wonderful, and she will happily get you trained if you'd like to spend um, two to five, four hours every week um, for the next month or two uh, looking at oak trees. So. Thank you for listening to my rambling. I hope you enjoyed it uh, and I'm here for questions.